I'm Mikey G, and it's Thursday, May 25th. Tesla's full self-driving beta has officially taken its first steps outside of North America, with the software making its way into cars in Australia, Germany, and Belgium. Tesla owners are still waiting for the long-promised actual self-driving capability, but in some markets, like Europe, the Pacific, and Asia, owners don't even have access to the beta program. The beta program enables Tesla vehicles to drive autonomously through most driving scenarios, including traffic lights, but under heavy supervision from the driver at all times. It requires frequent driver interventions on top of supervision, and therefore it's still considered a level 2 driver's assist system. Tesla Scope, which tracks Tesla software updates, detected the beta program going into cars in these countries. This is likely an early release for internal testing ahead of the regulatory approval within those markets. A new picture of a Tesla Cybertruck prototype has revealed the interior of the electric truck. While it's not too far out of a departure like the outside is, it still has some quirks that are definitely Tesla. The instrument cluster is replaced by a single horizontal tablet in the center of the dash, which is quite normal by now. The picture gives a decent look at the driver's point of view, and the steering wheel is kind of a cross between the yoke and a traditional Tesla wheel. As an oblong oval with kind of a straight top and bottom, the steering column also lacks turn signals or a wiper stock. The ramping windshield on the outside creates a long velured clad dashboard on the inside, which looks large enough to hold a few pizza boxes side by side. The center console appears to be a solid unit and not a transferable seat, such as in the earlier prototype. Original Tesla Roadsters are starting to go for far out collector prices as three non-working vehicles are about to sell for almost a million dollars. Just this last May 2nd, three brand new original Roadsters were found sitting in a shipping container in China, sitting for over a decade. We've been following the auction of these vehicles, which has been quite interesting, considering the batteries are probably toast after sitting dormant for longer than my children have been alive. Gruber Motors, which specializes in fixing Roadsters, is hosting the auction, which is now showing a bid of $800,000. That is for all three vehicles, though. The auction ends tomorrow on May 26, when the last big bids are expected to come in. There seems to be a recent shift in Tesla's collectible popularity, as just last year a working original Roadster sold for $250,000. It did have low mileage and a low VIN, but in this case, they would need total battery replacement. Vietnamese EV maker VinFast issued a voluntary recall for their entire first batch of VF8 electric SUVs sent to the U.S. Similar to Tesla, the word recall is being used, but the problem is going to be fixed with an over-the-air update. The so-called recall comes after the U.S. National Highway Traffic Safety Administration said, quote, a software error may cause the multifunction head unit display to go blank. Now, as a result, it may not show critical safety information, including the speedometer or warning lights, increasing the risk of a crash. VinFast is rolling out the update today, May 25th, to fix the glitch free of charge, and they will notify the owners by mail starting on May 29th. This isn't expected to amount to too much of an issue on public roads because, as of now, the 999 VF8 SUVs that have shipped, 111 are in customers' hands, 153 are in fleet service hands, and 739 are still in VinFast's possession. Stellantis revealed a new investment in Lytem, an advanced materials company and pioneer behind the lithium sulfur EV battery. Lytem says its battery addresses the challenges typically associated with sulfur, enabling twice the energy density, improved payload, and roughly a 60% lower carbon footprint than traditional EV batteries. The company says that their secret sauce is their proprietary 3D graphene super material. Now, perhaps more importantly, the raw materials can potentially be sourced and produced entirely in the U.S., Canada, or Europe. Stellantis says that it plans to begin deploying Lighten's EV battery tech into their vehicles the second half of the decade as they work to introduce a lineup of affordable electric models at scale. Volkswagen Group's Rideshare Mobility Company has announced it's using Apex AI's software development kit to create its own passenger management system on their network of autonomous ID Buzz EVs. Volkswagen's Moya Company was founded in 2016 with a specific focus on rideshare technologies and fleet management. While Moya has its own wealth of experience and software, it says Apex AI's software development kit 
will expedite their process to bring viable passenger management systems to market. Moya says that it will develop its ID Buzz vehicles with Volkswagen's commercial to launch Europe's first fully autonomous mobility as a service network. They're going to begin in Hamburg, Germany sometime in 2025. This larger EV development will help Volkswagen claim victory on their goals of the number of EVs deployed and also models. The state of Minnesota is now joining the race for EV adoption, offering new stateside incentives. Minnesota's new law includes an EV rebate of $2,500 for the purchase of a new EV and $600 for the purchase of a used one. That puts Minnesota in the company of such states as Connecticut, California, Massachusetts, and Maine, and it joins Illinois as one of two Midwestern states with EV rebate programs. Minnesota legislators also approved $13 million for school districts to buy and maintain electric buses and charging infrastructure. Also, Minnesota's public electric utilities will now be required to file transportation electrification plans with the Minnesota Public Utilities Commission that will promote EV adoption among their customers. But we can't leave out the little guy. Minnesota dealerships will also receive a total of $2 million in one-time grants to offset infrastructure investment needs to sell EVs. In today's community comment found on YouTube, Robert Algier asks, Is it just me, or are Mercedes model and trim designators almost incomprehensible? I'm sure it all makes perfect sense to their engineers, but marketing should maybe step in and clean it up. Well, Robert, that is an argument as old as time itself from my perspective. I can't keep either Mercedes or BMW's model straight. To make matters worse, some companies copy this naming convention with the express purpose of trying to sound more German. I saw it in the bike world too, as a Chinese company called Bafang. They make great motors, but they decided to name everything with model numbers facing the consumer, different model numbers facing the bike companies, and still these numbers aren't entirely aligned with the specs of the unit. On a long car ride, I listened to a German guy and a Chinese guy arguing for about an hour over making barcodes and unified product numbers for all of these products. Now, the Chinese guy, despite acknowledging the benefits, simply stated it could not be done. On another occasion, I heard a different argument break out between a German designer and an Italian retailer. The German said that no one will buy something that doesn't work, and the Italian said that no one will buy ugly bricks. I suppose there's pearls of wisdom everywhere you look. Thanks for watching Quick Charge by Electrek. I'm Mikey G, and I hope you have a great day.